had like 20, 22.
Good evening, my day. Good evening, and welcome to Arts and Letters and a chance to talk with the aunties. We've just had a really um, very nostalgic preview of Joan and Pudi Powell's Nakul Aina film on Kaolave. Joan, will you tell us the actual the title, please, the complete title of it? It's just Kaolave Aloha Aina. Kaolave Aloha Aina. And it was a film that featured many who are connected to the island from our past and the island itself, um, the relationship of community re-engaging, caring for, and in Aloha Aina work. And while we were not online or live streaming, we were listening to Auntie Davey. Oh, sorry. I didn't say Joan. I said Auntie Joan. I didn't say Joan. Auntie Joan. I said Joan. So Auntie Joan, thank you for doing that film so that we can begin to enter a discussion about the nature of the times that we live in and the involvement of people in many different medium, in media. And we started with the film Ho'olavi of Haina and the work of you and Pudi Pao. And Daviana, Auntie Davy, was telling us while we waited the deep knowledge that she carries about the island. Because she's been in the work of Protect Ho'olavi Ohana. Or what did we figure? 40 years? <laughs> Over 30 Most years. <laughs> and also the third auntie in this crowd is Auntie Barbara Polk. And um, and my name is Miley Meyer. And you can call me Auntie. You can call me Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are all peers in different medium. And so um, I had asked how many of the group knew of Davies' work in the live group. And it fascinates me because this is a group that may or may not have a relationship to the work that you all have done. So it's important to just take a moment, and I want you to describe the work that you have done. And we'll use Koalave. All of you are involved across many, many types of projects in community that affect the well-being of our people and our lahui and our aina. But you have things that help ground you in the work that you do. So I'll start with Auntie Barbara. Barbara, what work do you do, and how are you connected to Koalave? Uh, I focus on doing books, publications, sometimes, you sometimes exhibits, but just to start, I focus on books and publications, um, and many of the books that I work on are community-based books, so they're projects that grow out of community interest, either in an issue or place, or, you know, the people, the family. How many times have you been to Koholabe? I have not been to Koholabe recently, but in the early 90s, um, I went many times. I would say based on the Koholabe and the Okanaloa, the book you were involved in, you and I were, were involved in Jai Pohaku, you probably went at least a couple times. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say something like 20. And your daughter Marie, how many times has she been on that? She's been there at least as many times as I have, just about. Um, although she was never able to go when I was just going with the Navy. Um, she went over many, many times. The Ohana. And that was a really critical experience for her. She started going over with the Navy and went over for several years. That was um, amazing for me to be able to experience I was actually over there working too much. Koalabi was a really good caretaker for your daughter. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You could imagine what it would have been like for her to be immersed in Hakiwaba with all the aunties and uncles. And, um, she had an incredible experience. Completely adopted <coughs> into PKO life there, and it was a really profound um, experience for her to really understand what it, what Ohana was and love for the land, and to see that all in action, and also see the destruction. Mm -hmm. But it gave her a really incredible sense of what life is about and what decision-making is about, and what good leadership is. And I think what was so incredible for me as she got 
older was how she used that gate. Um, what she was seeing around her on this. So oh, my Barbara, things you're saying are important for us all to hear. So yeah. truly, you know, reflecting on your daughter and um, the impact the island had on her life, and then also on yours and the work that you did on the Leo Okanaloa. And the time that you spent with the photographers, including Franco Samaragi, whose the exhibition we're sitting in the middle of. So I loved hearing the nostalgia of realizing how much Ho'olawe and Alua was part of your family life. And as a book designer and a, um, a very important person in the publishing, my publishing partner at Aipohaku, um, that book was a tribute to that relationship. And, and I love that we did that with that spirit. Um, especially the time peri period that it was published. Oh, it was a life-changing experience for me, no doubt about it. I mean, actually, I often say that about other books as well, but um, to have the, ex to be able to experience Aloha Aina, um, is such an acute reminder of what life is about and what it means to have a close relationship with the gods, the land, other people, place, the channels, the winds, Tahiti. It's um, huge there. And it's very hard to have that kind of experience on this island. It's, it's not impossible, we all know that, but it's much harder. And um, by having that so underscored for me in my time there, I purposely came home and began to make those connections on this island. That was, that was, it was very, I think many people have that experience yeah. there. That's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful place to start too, that Pilina. So Auntie Davy, you know, we were starting with you recollecting immediately so much historical information. And you as a professor of ethnic studies up at the university and a longtime PKO organizer and participant, tell us about you and your relationship with the island. And I'm gonna tell you a story about Rosie after. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aloha kaku. Um, well, <clears throat> let me start with a chant because I wanted to uh, connect to the island. And this is a chant that was given to us by Uncle Harry Mitchell, who we saw walking on the island with us. And it was given to him by his kupuna. And um, uh, when they, he, you know, they were all from Hulua, uh, Hulua um, Ula, which is, uh, Honua Ula, which uh, Koholawe is a ahupua'a within the Honua Ula Moku on Maui. And they had lived there and then when the volcano came, the last eruption, they moved to Keanai and Wailua Nui, but they still had that ancestral connection to Koholabe when they threw Honua Ula. So the chant goes, <coughs> the chant talks about the discovery of the island uh, and the, 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 when they're coming back from the island, when, when he said um, that the island looks like uh, heaven come down to earth. That's from this chant. So it goes, Uina. Kaulon e kapu ai kaua. Vehe vehe mai ne kahi au. Pu mai na wa a kaulua. Pu e ke kanaka mai kaua a mai. Pu kulu ka iwi o ka aina. Aila ni kohe malama lama. Po o hiki ke a moku ya kanaloa. A kua kamo ana ili mo ana uli. Po o hui ke a po o pili ke a moku. And that's only the first verse. And it says, you know, dawn is breaking and land is sighted. And um, that's where he says it looks like heaven come down to earth. Um, or another interpretation is it's talking about the name for Kolabe, Kohe Malamalamo Kanaloa, the shining birth canal of Kanaloa, is another interpretation. And so that chant connects us. And, and it also talks about the place names where Uncle Harry, you saw Uncle Harry at the top at Mua Ula'iki, and it talks about the, the, um, 
pohaku ahu uh, kapili oke ave iki that and gives the name for that pohaku that uncle was showing us at the top of the island that's the name of the island the 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 bell stone um, into which is needed the hidden knowledge of Kiave Iki. And he was one of the trainers of navigators on Koholave. So my, um, my involvement with the island um, starts when uh, George Helman and, and Emmett come and to campus where I was teaching and ask if they can come and talk to my students about what they had experienced. And if, you know, try to get people involved with uh, the effort to stop the bombing. And I had knew George because I went to Sacred Hearts Academy and he went to St. Louis and we were all in the same glee club. So, you know, we welcomed them in and then my students got really excited and we set up tables and, you know, petitions and we sold t-shirts and we had these photos like that one over there um, to educate the campus. And we had a concert with the Makas Sons of Niihau before they came, became really famous. It was just a great you know, time, and, and there's a lot of learning. I myself didn't get to go to the island until 1985. So uh, while I was involved then, and you know, when we lost George and Kimo, I remember we went, um, when he, and they, in the time that they were still searching for them, they, um, they called and they said we would um, light bonfires at pre-dawn on the eastern ends of every island. So it, wherever they are in the ocean, they might find their way. And so we well, all went to um, you know um, Sandy Beach and um, lit the fire there, and you know called and hoped that somehow they would be found, and they were never found. Um, but I first went finally made it to the island. I tried in 81. In my book, I talk about how I tried and we, you know, <laughs> the big storm, Love didn't the realize it was a big storm. And then we, you know, we was like, you know, we can't make it. My students were all jumping ship because it was too rough. And we jumped on the water off of Oluwalu, although, and then we went out to visit with Uncle Harry and Kenai Wailua Nui. But my, um, finally made it in 85, going over with Uncle Bobby Luuai and Kaohani Luuai as well, and, they, and Uncle Bobby and his sons continue to take us to the island today that we go on their, their boat, the Pualele, which had a historical connection. They used to go back and forth. The Pualele used to deliver water to the ranch. Um, and so they have a connection. They always fished around the island. And so I, you know, with, after my first time I went, I just continued to feel the call to come and get involved and work to heal the island. Mm -hmm. Mahalo. Mahalo for sharing that. And just quickly, um, before I have Joan talk about her connection, the first time I went to Koalavi was with Doc Burroughs and Rosie and the science hui, that the students. Yeah. And, and standing in the back and watching interest rise in all of them for the environment, for each other, for time spent, for, oh my God, I can't plug my hairdresser in, my hair dryer in. I'm like, you know, just the, the nature of understanding what we didn't know about um, how well we could do without things. And your daughter is now a scientist special, specializing in limu, correct? Uh, or, she's, or tell a, me she's an oceanographer, an but oceanographer. she's a microbiologist. Yeah, and you <laughs> could just feel that interest coming. We probably witnessed it in her with Doc Burrow answering endless questions. Rosie had endless questions about things coming out of the ocean. So, you know, those are generational things that, that continue on because we make the connection, and our children make those connections. Um, Joan, your connection <laughs> to Kaho Olave. Walter Ritty, who was one of the original people who landed on the island, uh, came up to our house in Manoa, where we had a video collective at the time. We were one of the first uh, groups of people who were starting to use the new small format video equipment that was coming out that was putting the media in the hands of people, you know. And, um, and he wanted to uh, uh, edit all this footage that his friend had shot, and so we, we let him use our editing facility. Um, and they, they took that video out and they played it around, showed it around the islands, and then a year later after uh, George Helm disappeared, uh, one of the Ohana members came back and said, we need to do a tribute to George Helm. So he brought all that black and white footage that had been shot, and we also gathered the news footage, 
And then the, the performance that you saw George Helm performing at Iolani Palace, that was a rally in 1977. We used some of that footage. We had a, well, anyway, we had to get permission from Don Ho <laughs> because Don Ho had financed the shooting of that day. Anyway, uh, and then we put together a 30, a 25 minute tribute to George Helm. And I have to say that that particular video has just gone. I mean, so many people have seen that video. It's gone on, on, on online. Anyway, so that was my first uh, introduction. I actually met George Helm. He came up to the house after Walter Ritty finished editing that piece, and, and Walter had asked for, I made 30 copies of the tape so they could spread it around to the different islands. And I remember George, the one and only time I met George Helm outside of shooting him at the palace was when he came up to our house in Mano and picked up the 30 copies of the tapes. But anyway, so I had never, I, it took me a while to get on the island too, even though I was making all these videos and stuff. And uh, it was Davianna's fault. Uh, she went and got funding from the Hawaii Committee for the Humanities to pay for us to go over. Now, everybody else goes over on a, zo on a boat and then a Zodiac, but we flew over on helicopters <laughs> because, <laughs> because of the video equipment. We just couldn't, it's really hard to, salt, video equipment doesn't like salt water, so we, we had to. Uh, so that was nice because we actually, um, one of the trips actually did a whole circuit of the island from the helicopter shooting everything. and. I apologize if anybody gets seasick watching a uh, handheld video, from aerial video. <laughs> we didn't have a stabilizer or anything, so we're trying to hold it as steady as possible while fighting motion sickness ourselves. Um, that was a whole week we spent just studying the archaeological sites. And uh, similar to what Barbara said, uh, I have to say the feeling of being on that island, even though you're roughing it, you're constantly <coughs> wrapping up your video. You're traveling on the back of a Navy truck, a transport truck, and, and the dust is swirling all around you. So be anytime, ap any, anytime we got back in the truck to travel, we had to wrap up all our equipment with all kinds of plastic and hold on to it, you know, and go to the next location and wrap it and get out and shoot. The wind, I don't know whether you noticed the wind. The wind is just mean over there. And we, we actually ordered a special tripod, a real heavy duty tripod, because we knew we were going to be fighting heavy wind gusts. And, uh, but in spite of all that hardship, we were just blissed out by that island, the, the, the peacefulness of it, the no city lights. The, um, it just harkened back to another time. And I think the only other time we felt that way was my Pui Pao and, my, and myself was up on Mauna Kea. I mean, despite the observatories up there, you kind of get that same feeling of just this peacefulness. And um, so I just feel so blessed that Daviana asked us to do this documentary. We went back several times. We did that one hour, one week on the island archaeological survey. And then we went when they did the Makahiki opening and the Makahiki closing. And uh, Rodney Morales helped write this script. And all these, the Lico Martins is the one that sings that song. Um, but it was written by Lester Bailey, who I didn't even know who he was. But anyway. It, it all came together. It was just all miraculous how it came together. But um, yeah, it make, left a deep impression on us just being on that island. It was a blessing. And you know, you've been making films since 81, so over 40 years. 75 and myself. 75, but, but okay. But we were always, yeah. you know, we were like the eyes of the land. Now, Mako Okaina, we were, um, anytime there was an eviction, a land rights struggle, water rights struggle, a desecration of sacred places, we were there with the camera. So it was like on the list of things to do, you know. Yeah, Kaho Alave was a big one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot to do in that Aloha Aina, Aina Aloha, the land that you're talking about, being on island for all of us. Um, it definitely was life-changing. And there was things that we all did there that we could never have experienced anywhere else. Anywhere else. So we've got here with us a filmmaker, an educator, publishers, and community workers, so we're all blended in this area and we're all friends. So take a moment and, and imagine really trying to articulate through the lens that you sit with Aloha Aina and think about Ko'olawe and your experiences with Ko'olawe. How, how does that embodiment of your work connect you to Aloha Aina? What, what is that translation for you in the work that you do? Could be an easy 
a short or a long answer? Davy, you have the biggest smile. I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> That's. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I guess um, really, really learned about Aloha Aina from Uncle Harry Mitchell primarily um, when I didn't get to go to the island and he took us to Kenai Wailua Nui and we just got thrown into the Lo'i Kahalo patches with him and then, um, you know, understanding how these rural communities have been so important in perpetuating our cultural um, beliefs and customs and practices because it's in these rural communities that people still fish for subsistence and farm for subsistence. And so these practices this of Aloha Aina, this knowledge of Aloha Aina, the science of Aloha Aina was all part of their day-to-day -day life, which those of us growing up in Honolulu had been disconnected from. So, um, you know, it's as you're saying, it, it's when you're on Kolave, you know, you're immersed in, in the Aina. You're, it's everywhere. You just, you know, y you need to just be very alert because you need to know how to adjust to whatever is changing and happening in the land, in the ocean, with the wind. Everything can change in a moment. And um, we lose that consciousness here in, in the city, surrounded by, you know, in a house and you don't get out or, you know, in a classroom. You don't get that same closeness to the aina. So, um, you know, that, that aloha aina was uh, still very much a part of the rural communities. And for myself, I, uh, with um, my partner, Emmet Aluli, that you saw there, we were involved also with Palikapu Denman that you see there in the film, with other Aloha Aina efforts to, um, the pri other primary one was to stop the um, geothermal development that was would desecrate Pele, and they wanted to take out 500 megawatts. I mean, they wanted to generate 500 megawatts of steam using the steam of, of Pele. So we had to organize to stop that desecration, uh, and we, were, we, we finally succeeded. Uh, we also, as an ohana, worked when um, Uncle Leslie Kululoyu, you saw in the film, was a cultural monitor for the disinterment of our kupuna at Honakahua on Maui. And by the time he told us about it, he said, you know, you know, but the, he, when he told us there was like 500, they had already taken out 500 of our kupuna from the, near, the ocean near uh, Honakahua, I mean, the, the sand and and the dunes there. And then when we finally showed up and said, we got to stop this, they had already taken out 800. And then, then we, we showed up there at the site, and then we decided we're going to take this to the Capitol. And we had a 24-hour vigil where every hour in the hour we prayed and chanted. And finally, by the end of that 24 hours, Governor Waihe'e had called the developer and the landowner and you know, it began a process to stop that disinterment. And even at that, it had already gone up to 1,000 before it stopped. Um, and that led to important laws to stop the desecration of our Ibi Um So we were, as Ohana, we got involved in these other, these other efforts as well. And, and of course, learning about that. And all of these, you know, I began to then work with these communities to how do we protect our Aina from development and protect the resources our communities rely upon for subsistence. So I worked on Molokai with helping to document what kind of subsistence fishing and farming is done there, as well as Kenai Wailua Nui. We um, did a study there to, as, a, as a historic cultural landscape. We did a study in Kauai. So I began to, you know, realize how important these communities are. That, that's really the pico of Aloha Aina, and that's what I call the, or the kipuka, where the, you know, where the, they had protected our cultural practices in these rural communities, these kipuka, and then that's how we, as gender, Hawaiians coming from Honolulu in this age, could reconnect. And we reconnected through Koholabe. Koholabe was mm -hmm. the key 
it was everybody's island, not you know, not because nobody lived there, but everybody could relate to it. And through Kaolave and, and that you know networking through Kaolave, then that's where we begin to learn and appreciate and then support each other's efforts, be it Pele or be it Onakahua and our Ivi Kupuna. You know, we we had to all continue to work together. And then now it's and the need was clear and translated. And, and yeah. yeah, yeah. But right. the organizing aspect, it's an important one. So um, we're going to circle back and talk more about how we translate that in today's world. But in the world of publishing, Barbara, how, how do you feel Aloha Aina has been reflected in your work? It's an easy one. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to link a little bit to Davey's story to end up with Miley's question. After spending a lot of time on Koholawe, you know, but, but I wasn't there every day. In coming home, I realized that I had to uh, connect here, and in more than one way. I, I had to, you know, both co connect with the land, but I also had to connect with the, um, the old timers and the kupuna of the, a community that I was linked to, um, but I didn't have a strong link to it. It, and that was uh, Y and I, and Ohiki Lolo and Makua, um, because my grandfather's family was still living there, and I was familiar with it, and familiar with that these were the people who were still, um, whose lives are still completely in tune to the land and are still have a subsistence connection, and they still were connected to the language and the place names and their burial caves. I'm not Hawaiian, but these are extended family for me. So I made a really conscious effort to reconnect um, with the Waianae community um, and the family members there um, in order to have it as part of my daily life here. And I did that mainly through Ka'ala Farm, which is still in functioning in Makaha, in um, Waianae Valley, and um, ended up serving on the board there and being in, in really engaged in their work, which is trying to be a cultural kipuka for that community and working with families, old folks, and um, kids at risk, and always under the guidance of Kupuna. Um, simultaneously, I was making a connection again as an adult and, you know, getting into middle age with the family that I had known as a child and who my grandparents were very close to. And being able to look at what the, the stresses were out in that community and what was going on out there in terms of the challenges of um, problems with leadership, um, problems, of course, all sorts of social problems with housing, um, being thrown off of the land. It was, you know, very, very, um, and still is, really incredibly challenging. Um, but having that as kind of a daily, weekly, monthly um, underpinning for me enabled me to really jump ahead when I engaged with other communities. So when I came into a book project on the community of Kailua on the Windward side, the experience both on Koholawe and my ongoing experience on the Waianae side enabled me to just take a leap forward in terms of trying to think through what, where are we going to go here. But of course, in working with community in any situation, you have, to, you have to take them where they are, take them at the point where they are, but know that it's actually going to go further. And um, I think that's how working with Koholawe enabled me to both connect with my family in Waianae learn from them, and then begin to work in my place. I was born and raised in Kailua, 
and also happened to have a book project there, which of course I called on Daviana to come and shore me up, mm. <laughs> and Miley. <laughs> and it's, um, it's actually resulted in mm. a, a project now, which is an Aloha Aina project of um, re re-engaging and, and bringing back a thousand acres of color lands, watershed, forest, and also Hawaiian engagement on the land. And you know, I just realized, if you really do have the kind of experiences we had with Ko'olawe, you know what to do next. You need to internalize and bring it into your daily practice. So again, you've all translated into larger audiences the nature of the Lohaina experiences that you had on Ko'olawe, in how many times you get to be um, swimming in the ocean above a, a whale that's underneath sleeping, or to see the stars, or just the, the nature of being present in that kind of experience, and then translate it again through film, through books, through uh, lecturing and talking with students and being part of an educational system. So one of the things that I'm um, interested in, because that was how long ago that the bombing was stopped, and it was stopped when we all shared the messaging of what could we do individually and together. And the pilina is still there. So here we are, how many generations or how many years later, but the military is a presence here. And that bombing that stopped on Ko'olawe, you know, let's talk a little bit because you have relationships with the military in the work, touching the work that you do. And so I'm curious how you feel um, you know, the past, does it continue to repeat itself? I mean, here we are in a modern conundrum with people who know what to do. We know what to do, and the military knows what it should do. But how are we translating our lessons from the past? Barbara did it in her own relationship with family, coming back into the changes and applying them in Manuili, you know, et cetera. So, we're learning, we're, we're, we're inventing ourselves and putting ourselves back in these situations. So here we are as upuna and as aunties relating to the military in 2022. So I'm curious in your relationships with the military, how you see how we can be effective as community workers. You know, all, I, all as you're talking, all I can think of is walking across that hard pan on Kaho'olawe and you saw them the little munitions that were embedded in the ground and stuff, and just knowing we had to have an EOD, an explosive ordnance technician, with us at all times because it was so dangerous over there. And we were introduced to all the munitions that were we could possibly encounter. They had what they called a boneyard. You go through the initiation when you first go on island and it shows you all the munitions that you have to watch out for. And, and even <laughs> they describe a white phosphorus uh, munition that if you step on it, the white phosphorus will burn through your the sole of your shoe and into your skin. <laughs> so that's one you especially have to watch out for. And and uh, and just seeing all that and going down on the ground and um, we felt kind of like in, invincible, you know. <laughs> well, we're going to be protected. We have we're the video crew, you know. <laughs> we're, we'll be protected because we got to get these shots. But uh, I was just thinking that's just the antithesis to Aloha, you know, what happened to that island. And um, from the time I was little, I remember I always wanted to, sh when I saw something incredible and compelling, and I, I always couldn't really enjoy it until I said, had somebody else share it with me. Look at that over there, that incredible, you know. When I came to Hawaii and learned about this beautiful culture here, I just wanted to say, Look at this beautiful culture world. This is what you can be. You can, you know, you can live like this. And and our whole, you know, I follow Buckminster Fuller, who said, you know, um, if people have the information, they will make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. So we, so I, that's why I got into me media and video in the first place. Is because people weren't getting the information. They weren't getting it through the mainstream media, the newspapers. We would, mm -hmm. when we were based in Honolulu, uh, we'd go over to the neighbor islands and we'd see headlines on those neighbor island newspapers saying something, you know, the geothermal or this was the eviction was happening or something was happening with the Aina, and and we weren't hearing that on the news in Honolulu, you know. So we thought we just got to get all this stuff out there. We were using the public access channels originally. We went on to 
putting stuff on PBS Hawaii and then some of our stuff got on PBS stations around the country. So my whole thing is share this beautiful ethic of aloha aina with as many people as possible. It's so powerful and um, Hawaii can, we always know Hawaii can teach the world so much. So that's what I feel. And then now I'm not doing active production anymore, but I shot 40 years worth of <laughs> video that now has to be preserved for all of you, your mo'opuna, <laughs> to know what happened during this time, in this last quarter century of the 20th century, quarter of the 20th century, you know, all the efforts that it took to, um, to preserve this, this aina. So it's, it's very much in a communications thing, like books, books, same thing, you know. Just, uh, you know, watching the film though, no, listening to Uncle Harry talk about all the different plants and the way he related to place, you realize that that's the thriving indigenous future, remembering, again, what our kupuna knew. So it was captured, thank God, for those of us who don't have kupuna with us. So film is one of those, those reality checks that bring us forward into our past. So again, here we are. How do we keep this thriving indigenous future? What, what, what is your vision to keep it going? And is the military as a presence because it dominates our ability to do that right now, the presence of, of the outsider. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, we have to get past any complacency. I think um, we, you know, the, for a long time, I think the knowledge about the uh, Red Hill and the uh, petroleum tanks came out. They they said it got declassified. I think they said 1965 or so. I remember my students doing research on it, and they were saying how the Navy was touting it as one of the wonders of the world mm -hmm. that they had built th these tanks, you know, and has uh, have these you know petroleum there, and it was just you know crazy at the time, and yet it continued without anybody able to penetrate to show how how absurd it is to have these petroleum tanks, you know, so many millions of gallons, I don't know. Anyway, it took the contamination of the military families to, sh you know, bring it to the fore. Because nobody was believing it, and they're believing that the, the Navy. It's just like how you saw in the film, you know, the guy saying, oh, uh, if, if we can't continue to use Kohlabi, then we're going to have to move our training elsewhere. And we said, yeah, go. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, why do we need to be training anyway? It's not because it's, it's defending anyone in any effective way. It's, it's an act of aggression. So we need to, um, you know, just cut through what the military is trying to make, make us feel complacent. They put forward their Punahou graduate commander, or whatever his <laughs> name is, to, to make us feel like they're part of us and concerned with us. But really, the, they have their own agenda. They have no really concern about Hawaii or our people. And we just have to keep supporting our, you know, put the pressure on our Department of Health and, you know, support our congressmen, thank goodness for Kai, um, Kaheli, to uh, stop, for, use whatever power Congress has, or the president, to stop. And you've seen the, it work. You've seen it Red Hill. time and time again. Yeah, how can we get, you know, in this case, President Bush stopped it only because he wanted to get Pat Psyche elected to, yeah. from Congress to Senate. What kind of incentive can we give to President Biden to stop it? This is insane. How can, if, if not, then how can we support our con congressional people to put it on Congress's agenda to stop it? So we had, over time, from 1976 to 1990, you know, when we started 1976, like I was saying, people did it, you know, what are you doing? What are, you know, you, you're trying to take on the, the Navy, you're just communists, you're activists, you know, using all of these terms that, that to, to discourage us from uh, challenging the military, which, are, you know, so many people's jobs depended on the military, and they were part of the ruling, you know, elite here in Hawaii. So, uh, but it, from 1976 to 1990, we had won over the hearts and minds of everybody. I mean, even Senator Inouye finally came around, and he was the strongest supporter of the military anywhere in the world. He was the head of the Military Appropriations Committee. 
he was funding whatever the military is doing any, everywhere in the world. And so finally we had reached the point where everybody could see it was insane to continue bombing. We've reached that point with, with yep. Red Hill. Everybody can see it's insane yep. to threaten our water supply. I don't know why they're not drawing the connection and letting the tourists know. Why are you coming to Hawaii? Your, our water supply is threatened. Yep. <laughs> you know I mean? But you know that idea of access to information and really um, being steady in the commitment to make sure that that information is carried out into community and winning people over and just steadiness in the whole more of it. But there you go. We're in another iteration of it. And you all have lived through, we've all lived through the various iterations that get us to a point in time where, where we're smart in what to do next. So the indigenous futures that are part of the dialogue now, we're affecting that dialogue. So what is continuing in that vein? Barbara, do you have any comments from where you sit? I mean, we live outside of military installation. We live the, the windward side of Oahu is a military installation, as is the island. We live there. You know, looking back on Ka'olawe and what that arc of your working, you worked the closest with the military in order to access that island in your, when you were coming and going all those times. So, well, one, thoughts? One thing that, that actually is, was, I started out working with, you know, really it looked like the island. It was. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> started out with him. I don't know. Yeah, Metzendorf. Yeah. <laughs> Love that you all know. Yeah. <laughs> short shorts? Yes, like, exactly. Short shorts. <laughs> I was going to say something about that. Like, oh my God. Oh, Sign yeah. the picture. Okay. Right, the short shorts. And, right. But, but he said, welcome, after, welcome to my island. Right. He said, to the whole pond. <laughs> That's so good, it's bad. You know it's going to end. Yeah. No, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good experience to have to deal with him. And the other mm -hmm. thing was their reference to place to places it was as if we, you know after if we came in at Hakiwava and then they came down to get us and we went up you know we'd been doing our homework on place names and the nature of things we had, and we were beginning to get some of the conveyance reports um, so that we had we had a lot of information and it was as if you had entered a foreign country they didn't use the place names they used all these different That's wacky. That's huge. We had no idea <laughs> what they were talking about <laughs> or where we were going, and we, we actually had to have a you know interpretive map that we made that had <laughs> all their names as well as the names that we had learned. But um, one of the things that did happen is that a couple of years into the project, they put Mike Nahol PE in charge. And he became the person that we were dealing with, and we could we could never have done our project if that hadn't happened. Um, yeah, I don't I can't, I don't know that I could answer your question, but I will say that for me, experiencing that military culture, which I'd never I, of course I have relatives who spent their careers in the military, but I have never had any really close experience with them, but to watch how that worked and also the psychological part of it where the the whole operation, they were taking care of their, all of the people that were under them. Yet, of course, we know that there's a, there was a huge risk to everyone in all aspects of everything that they were doing, but they were all, at the same time, they were pretty well taken care of in terms of um, kind of their lifestyle and their feeling of a certain sense of security. Um, and in a way, experiencing that and watching that in action, for me, felt very similar to um, the big developers here. And e although, you know, the whole process of sugar and the plantation economy and living within a plantation setting, you know, that was already very much on the wane. But living within 
sort of the capitalist development scenario of the way Oahu was developing in some ways reminded me of what I was seeing. I was just working with the EODs. I was, we were with them all day. I learned a lot about what their past experiences had been and how it was coming back and forth to Koholawe and just wa watching that. It was not dissimilar to um, our big developers here in terms of how they will paint a picture about uh, how they want to convey their project and how they are treating their employees and the sort of the myth of kind of protection and creating a better life. Mm -hmm. It was very, very similar. That was interesting to me. And, and both of them had a kind of, um, you know, the destructiveness of to culture, to the land, to one's sense of living, it felt and somehow very translating parallel. it as something that we wanted, or that we want. Exactly. If you call something it that a was a good name thing, and you put right. the right person mm -hmm. in front. Right. So you know, we have a few minutes, about ten to to kind of wind down and and really think about as as aunties in the time of our life, and in the things that we've lived through and experienced. And there's been a lot. And we're in another huliao. We're in, Hula Macaulier calls it the Aupulapula. So it's an era of abundance for our communities and, and Hawaiians and people who believe in that essence of what we bring to a place, to our place. Whether it's relearning names, saying a chant until we remember it, repeating, forgiving ourselves for what we don't know, for what we did not have access to, but recognizing Hawaii is something special and devoting your life to it. So here we are in 2022. If it's predicted that we have entered into this epoch of abundance, this Aho Pula Pula, how do you, with your life experiences, translate the work that you have ahead? You know, Kaha'olawe was a win, but actually all they did was transfer themselves over to Pohakoloa on my island, on my island, on the island of Hawaii. And they're just doing the same thing over there with nobody witnessing what they're doing. We don't know how they're poisoning, intoxifying the earth over there and the water tables right underneath there too. You know, and not only to chemical toxins, but um, radiation, uh, um, uh, what do you? Depleted uranium. Yeah, yeah, depleted uranium, which is, was used in some of the um, rockets that they fired, they test fired back in the 60s that depleted uranium um, is in munitions all over the ground. And what happens is they, uh, when they're hit by current, and they, they bring bomb bombers in from Arkansas and from Alaska and everything to bomb Pohakuloa, and then they just fly back home again. I mean, it's crazy what's going on up there. Nobody knows what's going on up there. But anyway, if they hit, if they happen to hit fields where there's this depleted uranium, it goes up into the air, it's aerosolized, and it goes up into the air. And when you breathe anything, radiation, you're inviting lung, lung cancers, all kinds of internal cancers. And so that is blowing around in our air all over the big island. <laughs> so I'm not seeing, I'm seeing, we're still got major <laughs> struggles ahead, you know. And Good, so there's a, mil a film coming then. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm leaving it to the younger emerging filmmakers to, uh, <laughs> who have like, Yes, like young filmmakers, <laughs> Mikey. Who have the uh, strength to carry <laughs> the equipment around the lava fields of the Big <laughs> Island <laughs> and who can penetrate the, I mean, the middle, this is acre, I'm talking hundreds of acres. But Joan, you bring up a control. really important point. So wh what is, th where is the next generation of filmmakers? Are you feeling it? Are you seeing oh, yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. So filmmakers in the, in the circle, raise your hand. <laughs> Kaylee, Mikey, Tiare, all you, okay, look, look, Sanzia, oh my God. So there you go. So, so the word, feeling, get, like I say, nobody knows what's going on. Field trip to Pohakaloa. They can tell everybody what's going on. Yeah. Although the military really keeps a tight ship up there, that's for sure. And this is the army, not the navy, and not that there's much difference. But so I the work the isn't navy done. Was better, easier to get along. <laughs> the work isn't done, but you can identify it from a mile away. So, I'm glad you called that out, and yeah. and people like Luana. And, and Craig Neff, Luana Busby and Craig Neff are in regular protocol in those places. Again, trying to recall the, the names, the wins, the, and calling in the attention. So we have to know what we don't know. We have to learn what we don't know. Davey, what do you think? 
in, in at this point? Um, I think we, uh, when you're asking about our indigenous futures, we are, you know, looking at all. How do we deal with the impacts of the military or the developers? The, the that, you know, has brought us to the brink of this um, climate change that's going to raise the the sea levels and. Um, how do we begin to prepare ourselves? And um, that's where we turn to our indigenous knowledge to understand that these kinds of changes have occurred historically as well through other kinds of um, ecological changes. There's been sea level rise. We know that from our, our chants and our mo'olelo where they speak of these you know, dynamic events and uh, sea levels rising. And... Um, and uh, I, well, we, when we had the IUCN, we took some of the um, you know indigenous peoples to Haula, and one of the um, men from the Maori uh, delegation told me, you know, this is the time of our Atua, and I said, yes, it is. It's the time of our Akua, because in ha in Hawaiian, Akua are the gods. You know, I mean, not their gods, but they're the Hawaiians honored all of our natural life forces as gods. So Kanaloa is the ocean and all of the dyna dynamics around the ocean, the currents, the deep water, uh, the, the, the lens under our, our islands. Uh, Lono brings the rains for our season to bring us the, the life. And um, Kane is also the sun, the energy forms of the sun, and then also the various water sources we have. And what we see and what we've seen in Hawaii in this hulihia is that these forces are having to balance. Because of the destruction of capitalism and imperialism and military on our, on our environment, on our islands, uh, and worldwide, now the natural life forces have to equal and balance. And that, that's what the idea of Pono is, is achieving balance, or lokai, it's achieving balance. So now it is the time of the akua to respond to achieve that balance. So we see the, the big um, rain bomb over um, uh, Hanalei. We see the Pele erupting in, in, uh, from all through Pahoa and to Kapoho. We see these natural phenomena, and that's our Akua. And the Akua is what's going to be, I mean, we have to begin to pay more attention to our Akua because that's, they have, the balance has to happen. It's a natural law of balance. And that's our kua. It's a time of our kua. And how do we begin to be more aware and, and cognizant? And how do we begin to demand that natural law takes precedence over human law? Now, this is what they were saying up at uh, Mauna Kea. They're saying, oh, we're, you know, where's, where's the, the rule of law? Where is the rule of law? Where is the rule of natural law? What we, our kupuna called kanavai, you know, that our nature is telling us the, it's an imbalance. We have to balance it. Nature is telling us what is being hap what is happening at Kapu Kaki, the Red Hill, is against nature, and it's it's a violation of nature. And how do we begin to be more aware and take a stand for those laws of nature? Take a stand and be aware of our akua. And that's what Koholabi has done to say, connect us with our akua. You know, Koholabi is Kanaloa, and all of those life forces and the Kanaloa force is empowering us to continue that work, even take on the Navy, which is on, a, on, a, you know, on the ocean. And the Kanaloa has helped us. In our, in our fit to stop the bombing, it was Kanaloa and our, our chance to Kanaloa that ultimately slipped the Navy away. But yeah, we have to be more aware of our kua and understand that. And look into our chance and our mo'olelo, how did those forces take play and how and oh, be aware of that, not be afraid of it, but understand it's, it's nature now taking course. Which is a beautiful task for us all to really internalize how we can take that law of nature into our daily living. Absolutely. Barbara, any thoughts? Well, a couple of things come up for me, just to think about it in the context that Daviana just set forth. Some of that has to do with um, leadership and both in terms of you know who who is coming forth as sort of the natural leader in your community but also that really every every person has to pull up from themselves 
their capabilities of leadership and and it's a daily thing it's it's not something you do and then you're oh gee i'm too tired i don't want to do this anymore or you know i'm going to take time off here and come back in a few years it's it, because of the situation that we're in now that's so challenging and also because the our life force here is so connected to the land it's something that you, that has to be part of your daily consciousness and thinking and life and work and and what as soon as it is all of these things start to come into balance and begin to make sense and activate and i think that pko really was able to really live and show that mm -hmm. and if you have the opportunity to go to the island you'll see that and it will change your life but you know you've given us a wonderful kind of um, vision of our own involvement because my guess is every single one of you here is younger than the aunties. <laughs> so the aunties, <laughs> we've been at it for a long time and we've stayed steady and we've been inspired by the land and we've witnessed. So we're looking at all of you because you really need to internalize that belief system that it really is, you are the, the leadership. <laughs> That's got to take it forward so that we can all be not standing sidelines saying way to go, but we'll participate. But really, you're, you're, you're leading this, this effort that we're all touching on. And it is an extraordinary thing to imagine what is ahead with what we've all learned collectively, with the tools that we have, and the place that, that we live and care and, and really are committed to. Because um, I think it's, it's a... It's a reality, the indigenous reality and futures. We've tried a lot of other ways. And we've minimized, depending on what generation you were born in, the impact and, and incredible capacity of the Hawaiian ways. And now I think it's um, that ao pula pula. It's time to really know our own ways again. So all of you are included in that knowledge, accessing that knowledge. Ko'olawe, two of us are Maoli and two of us aren't. And it doesn't matter. And uh, Pinky Thompson used to say, it's not what's in your veins, it's in your heart, which is what a kupuna from that generation used to say. But in the end, it's really the work that we do. It really is. And the work that we do together. So, Kelii, are we Pau? We're off the air. Okay. <laughs> Oh, we are? Okay, so ca can we forget about on or off the air? We're in the air. We're in the ethers. So can you please join me in thanking the aunties, Auntie Joan, Auntie Davey, Auntie Barbara, and Auntie Maya. Okay, so how is that? We're going to stop what we